My name is Jimmy Stitz, and I'm the strength conditioning coach for the women's senior national volleyball team. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about long-term athletic development for volleyball and what that looks like over the course of uh, an athletic career for an athlete and how we work to do that in the weight room specifically um, and work to develop that long-term athleticism. And so one of the things we notice, we all see without intuitively thinking about it, is that the younger an athlete is, the more their natural athleticism plays a role in their success. And so if you see a youth volleyball match, generally the best volleyball players are these super gifted athletes, the ones who are already coordinated or already have a base level of strength or can jump really high naturally. And that curve flattens as athletes uh, achieve certain um, milestones as athletes mature and their physical traits start to even out over time it becomes much more of a game of uh, who's actually a true volleyball player versus who is a true athlete or relies a lot on athleticism and so um, one of the things we have to do before we get too far into this is we have to talk about the definitions and definitions of what I'm calling buzzwords, words that you'll hear people like myself, strength coaches, but sport coaches and other people, gurus across the internet, will talk about these terms and try to make them maybe bigger than they really are. And so I want to go through a list of things that um, I think are important for us to understand as we dive into a little bit about uh, some training philosophy in the weight room and how we go about working for long-term athletic development for youth athletes as they work to achieve higher levels of performance. So the first buzzword and what it means is volume. Volume is really just a function of how much or how many. Truly, we think of volume as usually a, a number of reps, a number of sets, the combination of sets and reps. Sometimes it is just the length of time. Uh, volume is pretty easy to understand, but I think it's important to understand that it could mean many things. The same could be said about intensity. Intensity is how difficult are we making something? And now that's whether we're making it how heavy, how fast, how slow are we doing something? All of the changes in intensity, or all of the changes in uh, weight, speed, time, uh, would all fall into the category of intensity. Now a term often used by strength conditioning coaches, athletic trainers, anybody who deals with the human body is this concept of periodization. And what that really means is that it's a strategic implementation of specific training phases and what we understand is this complex is this uh, concept called the said principle specific adaptations to impose demands and we use periodization to implement the said principle and it allows us to train the body for known adaptations or expected outcomes and so periodization is essentially just a plan of periods of time that we use to manipulate variables to achieve certain goals. Next is this idea of complex, complexes and supersets. A lot of people think they're supersetting or complexing and really all that means is that you're pairing movements with complementary adaptations within the same workout. Maybe it's one right after the other, maybe it's uh, you'll do a lower body exercise and superset it with an upper body exercise or you'll do a strength movement, pair it with a speed movement. You hear these terms float around a lot, but essentially all we're talking about is the pairing of movements that have complementary adaptations or complementary outcomes together. This idea of undulating, um, that is a term used quite often these days to basically mean the emphasis or de-emphasis of variables. So you can undulate weekly, you can undulate monthly, you can undulate yearly. Uh, in some cases you could undulate within a training session, although that's much more uncommon. But undulation is just this idea that we are emphasizing different variables at different points in time, uh, all with the idea of a greater growth over a longer period of time. And then this idea of the stretch shortening cycle, and that's a physiological response to rapid change of muscle contraction. So the muscle fires in three different ways, concentrically or shortens. Uh, that's what a bicep curl looks like. It uh, fires isometrically or without movement. And that's, for example, how your muscles would be firing if you were pushing against an immovable object, a wall of some kind where the muscles are working really hard, but no movement is occurring. And then there's the eccentric muscle contraction, and that occurs as you lengthen the muscle. Generally, the lowering phases of a squat is a good way to think about what an eccentric movement is. The landing phase of a jump, 
uh, after you jump, you land and that's an eccentric phase. So with those definitions, I'd like to start talking about some of the focuses that we would uh, like to see as athletes and children, kids, youth, uh, mature. And so that's going to look a little bit like this. We'll have the stage of development and then the focus at which we should be there. So uh, I'm lumping pre-puberty all in one group. So that's essentially boys and girls who have yet to hit puberty. And I have the release of hormones associated with that. And essentially all we're looking to do is to teach them basic movement patterns. Squat, hinge, lunge, press, pull, step up and step down. That's also important. Jumping is a skill. Uh, landing is a skill. Throwing, swinging, hitting, any basic movement pattern, discrete movement pattern before you piece them all together and make them look like a volleyball play, for example. You want to make sure that athletes, young athletes specifically, can maintain posture, maintain coordination, maintain control in all of these movement patterns. In pre-puberty, I'm sorry, in puberty, uh, once the hormones begin to, to kind of release in the body and the athlete starts to ch see changes in themselves, uh, you're going to want to be careful to load the movement patterns, but to, to continue to develop the basics. So you would just begin to load these movements that we talked about pre-puberty, uh, start to put them under more tension, uh, make them hold them longer, uh, make them do them in series together, sets and reps, um, but load them in a way that's still safe for the athlete, but still staying within a basic framework of squatting, hinging, lunging, those types of movements. Then you get to late high school, and that's where you can start to develop your year-round plans uh, with undulating variables. So you can work with time, a phase of getting stronger, a time of building muscle, a time of working on speed or quickness, a time of being more powerful, and through the end of high school, you can layer those on top of each other to develop a more solid foundation and allowing the athlete to continue to play their sport at a high level. And then you get to the college level where I think the focus should really be on support and develop it development of the physical strengths and improve the areas of need. So by then the athlete has a pretty good understanding of what they're good at, pretty good understanding of where they need to improve. And it's, I believe, on all of us to understand those areas and help create the conditions for the athlete to make improvements in the big areas of need, but also to uh, continue to keep their strengths strong. Um, I think that's an overlooked aspect of, of training when athletes start to get to the college level is there are reasons that they're there and the reasons um, physically that allow them to do their sport well and we should be not just working on areas of need but also improving or increasing their likelihood that their strengths will stay strong and i think that's an important concept so now let's look at what a plan might look like like through maturity levels so the same maturity levels or the same uh categories we have pre-puberty what that's going to look like is one to two days a week with a focus on postural control and technique so we're just learning movements and this could be done in a fun way you can pair people up and do games uh, but the idea is less on mastery and more on variety and trying to help them understand that these are laying the foundation for a future of athleticism and being able to do things efficiently and effectively and keep them healthy above all else. And so then you can get into the puberty uh, age range as the athletes start to age. You can get up and add days of the week, add volume, again volume meaning potentially days of the week, uh, number of sets and reps. Uh, we can also add intensity and I would say you want to keep it as a low intensity meaning not a lot of weight, not a lot of speed, uh, but you can do it with uh, light weights and a lot of volume for them to achieve a lot of repetitions and I think that generally works well in a body experiencing puberty because there's a lot of changes happening already and you want to make sure that you're being really safe in how you're dosing in strength and conditioning and strength training to an athlete at that age uh, you really need to focus a lot of your time on uh, movement quality at that point and then we have the late high school phase, uh, sophomores, juniors, definitely seniors, when you can be doing much more volume and you can begin to undulate things. And so you have more time, they become more specialized. Uh, you, can, you can go through periods of strength and speed and body composition and all of these different variables uh, with an eye towards a season where winning begins to, to matter a little bit more. 
and then you have the college uh, stage of development and I think the focus is really the same as uh, as late high school but now you can hold them more accountable to the measurables uh, being a student athlete comes with a certain set of accountability and so now if people aren't improving there's better conversations that could be had as to why that's occurring you can start to bring in other professionals who I think uh, provide a lot of context to the athlete and provide a lot of insights into what may or may not be working uh, but I wouldn't say you're deviating too far from what they were doing in high school unless you have an athlete that maybe has just hit a growth spurt late in life or um, is a slow developer. Next we'll talk about the variables and the different phases and what that looks like. Um, I think first and foremost is if you think of a pyramid as kind of your base the first thing we always talk about with our players is uh, body composition. We think this is incredibly important, not necessarily just being lean or losing weight, but gaining muscle, I think, is another aspect that's overlooked. Uh, in a sport like volleyball, uh, muscle mass isn't necessarily a huge uh, predictor of performance, but muscle tolerance is, and muscle tolerance is your body's ability to be strong and withstand uh, training and that's where the next block comes in so after you've got your body composition in a place where you'd like it you can begin to work on strength and I think strength again using that word tolerance is really just an ability to withstand the activities you are being asked to do and generally that's practices and matches and then we have this concept of speed um, and I think everyone intuitively understands speed but what speed really does is it in its combination with strength gives us power and that I think is another incredibly uh, important variable. Some say it's the most important variable because it takes into account both strength and speed and I think that that is uh, uh, not far off. The other kind of tip of the pyramid and I'll go into more detail what this means in a moment but it's really fitness and for us on the national team level fitness is our ability to play our sport at the highest level for long periods of time and how fit and how well can we do that. Uh, for others that might just be withstanding you know, two and a half hour practices three days a week or one hour training sessions once a week. Uh, fitness can take on many different shapes for people, but the ultimate goal is to be able to play your sport at the highest level and feel like you can do it repeatedly uh, day in and day out and do it without getting injured. And that's my definition of fitness. So now let's look at these same uh, concepts, but just put some more words to them, uh, less abstract and more into the details. So with body composition, we are really talking about the reduction of body fat or the addition of muscle mass, but we're also talking about the development of the cardiovascular system. So the type of training you would do uh, to, to achieve body composition changes generally would work as well to improve our cardiovascular system. And I think that's a huge uh, foundation to lay. Next is strength, and again, I use that word tolerance to sport, and that comes through coordination, muscular and connective tissue strength. So not only just our muscles, but our tendons and ligaments as well are also improved uh, through proper strength training. And then we get to this concept of speed again, and that's usually an increase in quickness through neuromuscular training. So actually training the nervous system and its interactions with the muscular system uh, to improve quickness, explosiveness, whatever term you wanna use for speed, um, that is generally a neuromuscular phenomenon. And then we have power or the uh, ability to improve explosiveness through the stretch shortening cycle. So if you remember back to our definitions, the stretch shortening cycle is essentially a physiological phenomenon that occurs when the muscle goes from a rapid eccentric to concentric muscle action. So if you think about landing from a jump and then jumping immediately after, or running, sprinting is a plyometric activity. Um, that is power happening in an athletic sense. And then fit is just your ability to repeat that explosive activity, to be able to play volleyball or lift weights or train at a high level repeatedly is fitness. And I think that's a good way to think about that. So how do we do this? I think that's kind of the, the question. And I gotta be honest, I think it's, uh, it's not a one size fits all. A lot of it has to do with uh, athletes' individual stages of development, where they are currently, and how they've uh, perceived training in the past will drive a lot of this adaptation. And truthfully, it doesn't come to, it's not, it's not based on just your equipment that you have, but your mindset around your training and uh, who you have developing your plans, I think uh, is a really important piece 
to pay attention to because you can work really hard and make very little gains if you're not doing it in a succinct, uh, well thought out manner. So as a general rule, um, these are kind of some guidelines that I'd like to use. By no means is this the only way to do it. Uh, for body composition, uh, if we're looking for weight loss or endurance, we're looking at four sets of 10 to 12 reps with uh, light weights, and that will help with endurance and weight loss. Uh, and you can see there for heavy weights, essentially we just drop the volume and increase the intensity. We drop the volume, go to six to eight reps, increase the intensity, adding heavier weights. And that will work for hypertrophy, which is essentially uh, the opposite of atrophy, which means for muscle growth. Next, we have strength. Uh, strength takes on many terms. The way we train strength in our gym is that we'll do three to four sets of two to six reps with moderate to heavy weights. And so you can see there we've increased our uh, intensity and decreased our volume. So that way our intensity could be higher. Remember, volume and intensity generally have an inverse relationship with one another. You can't maintain high intensity for long periods of time. You have a very short window to be intense. If you want intensity to be high, volume must be short. And if you want volume to be high, intensity has to be short. And I think that's an important relationship to understand. Next, we have speed. And you can see here, speed is done generally the same as strength, you just change your intensity into lighter weights. And the reason that is, is because the body is smart. It trains and adapts to uh, the stimulus. Again, the said principle, specific adaptations to impose demands, says that if we want to be fast, we need to train fast. And you can't train fast with heavy weights. And so speed requires you to be moving quickly under lighter loads, but the volume can be about the same as with strength. And now here you have uh, power. Power is obviously the combination of speed and strength. And you can see again, we're, we're dropping the volume and, and modulating our uh, intensity. It's gonna be a little heavier than speed. Um, you're gonna have a little bit more weight, but the volume might be a little lower uh, as you're trying to work on the combination of higher intensity, lower volume, and working on power. And now fitness, I just have as a question mark because I think uh, that could take a lot of different shapes for people. And, and it's really just gonna depend on the amount of time you're spending and can delegate to training in the weight room, training on the volleyball court. And so what that looks like, I think is gonna look uh, different for everyone, but I'll give you a little um, guidance here in the next coming pieces. So in the off season, we generally train in these two bands. We complex or superset these things together in the off season. Generally, we'll start our season with a phase of uh, endurance or weight loss or hypertrophy down there at the bottom of the pyramid. And then we transition as soon as someone is comfortable with their body composition into a strength phase. And we hold that strength phase as long as we can until we get to a point in the season uh, where we have a lot of uh, competition density or a lot of matches happening. And then we transition to this model where we complex these blocks together. We never lose strength. Uh, we keep strength as a underlying foundation of our pyramid. It is constantly there, but we complex or superset it with speed and power. And so we might take the volume of strength down and increase the volume of power, but we're never fully leaving strength out of the equation. It is truly uh, a physiological phenomenon that that is so important for volleyball players to be able to withstand practices and matches the, at the intensities that they're asked to play them at. You have to have strength as a component to your plan in season and off season. It doesn't have to be the same emphasis throughout the year, but it can't go away completely in my opinion. And next is fitness. And to me, that's volleyball practice. And so most athletes, most volleyball players will develop their fitness through volleyball practice, through a two hour, two and a half hour volleyball practice. But if you need additional fitness, um, you would need to start to work in the conditioning or energy system development side, and that's a talk for another day. So uh, I'd like to just sum everything up by essentially saying, uh, long-term athletic development, building the base for youth athletes is just like any other skill. Uh, it takes practice, it takes diligence, it takes you understanding and putting focus into what your training is supposed to be 
and staying accountable to yourself and to your teammates. And just like any other skill with practice and focused attention, improvements will occur. Thank you for your time.